Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming on this lovely sunny day. Um, welcome to the ICA. Um, welcome to our Culture Now series, weekly series of lunchtime talks. Um, and for today's talk, I'm more than delighted to introduce Polly Morgan, who will be joined in conversation by Sue Hubbard. Um, Polly Morgan is a British artist who predominantly uses taxidermy to create her work. She's exhibited, um, at, has had solo exhibitions internationally and across the UK, exhibiting alongside artists such as Damien Hirst and Jeff Koons, and she's lived in London since, 1980, since 2005. Um, Sue Hubbard is a freelance art critic, novelist, uh, and award-winning poet, lecturer and broadcaster. Her poems have been read on Radio 3 and Radio 4, and she's contributed to many arts programmes, including Kaleidoscope, Poetry Please, Night Waves and The Verb. Um, please welcome me in joining them to today's talk. I would obviously remind you to turn off your mobile phones. Um, there will be a question and answer series later on in the talk, and please do wait for the microphone if you wish to ask, um, ask a question. Many thanks. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone, by the way. <laughs> yes, sorry, we just realised that we hadn't got our fans off being interrupted by your own phone and while you're talking. It's a, not a good way to start. And I've broken my glasses, so I'm going to have to peer up to you. Um, forgive me. Anyway, um, it's suitably dark in here for your work yeah. there, I think. Um, I'm interested in the question in a way of, you know, do artists spring fully formed into existence or, um, you know, nature nurture of being an artist? So tell me a bit about your upbringing. Um, I was brought up in the countryside, um, probably quite an unconventional upbringing, actually. It didn't really feel it at the time because it never really does when you're a child, I suppose. You just accept what's going on. Um, but my dad worked with animals. Um, he, wasn't, he wasn't really a farmer. He had a very sentimental attitude to the animals that he worked with. So he had angora goats for a long time, about 200 or 300 of them. Um, and the business that he'd set up was something to do with the angora fur. Uh, and then he moved on to ostriches briefly, because I think during the BSE crisis, he thought that the ostrich meat was going to be uh, the new steak. Uh, but that didn't quite kick off. <laughs> Um, we variously had llamas, chickens, dogs, cats, budgies flying about the house. Uh, we'd have baby goats sleeping in the dog basket when I was growing up. I was completely surrounded by animals all the time and it just seemed the most natural thing then. But it was only when I moved to London later and suddenly I noticed their absence that Did you uh, I realised that they... Uh, we didn't eat our animals, we ate meat. But no, he never... And it wasn't a farm. We, he rented a few fields, but... Um, Really, uh, his there were I various weird how business far ventures. The went yeah, no, it went that far. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, they all died natural deaths actually, and uh, I do remember having to. One of my jobs as a teenager was to drive up the dead carcasses to this local abattoir where they would turn them into dog food, and his Dad would forget about them sometimes, and they'd lie and sort of rot for a couple of days. And I just remember that smell was really so. It was quite a good. Um, uh, probably a good quite training for a taxidermist. Very good training, I think, yeah, okay. because everything now seems very clean in comparison. So, okay, you um, happily um, sloshing away, as most children would, uh, with paint and water among dead carcasses. But we've established that bit. But um, what about art? Was there any art in your background? Not a lot, no. Um, my parents... My mum worked as a secretary and as a teaching assistant, and well, she had hundreds of jobs, sometimes she'd deliver flowers, um, but not art, although she was interested in art. I do remember that she'd take us to exhibitions if she got the chance. She was just always so busy running around after the three of us, and with she had three jobs normally at one, one time, so she, I think... Where did you actually grow up? In the Cotswolds, in a village um, about 20 miles from Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, Laurie Lee country. Uh, slightly east of that, but yeah, not too far. Um, yeah, so we would, I was aware of art and I was interested in art at school. I was definitely drawn to it. I was always happiest in the art room. 
Um, but it wasn't a part of my upbringing. We didn't really know any artists. My grandmother would do a bit of a few sort of watercolours of birds in the garden, but it, it never really occurred to me as a career option at all, as something that I would ever do other than in my spare time, I suppose. I would always draw things and paint and just mess around with whatever materials that we had to hand, really, when I was growing up. But I didn't really see it as art. It was just a way of entertaining myself, really. So you, you just made funny little things from bits and pieces. I just, yeah, from a very young age. I remember when I, I was about... One of my earliest memories is just cutting up loads of tiny little squares of coloured paper and insisting that I posted them to a friend of mine at nursery group. And my mum said, well, what are it's you going to write with it? And I said, well, nothing. very conceptual. Because <laughs> <laughs> she said, what, what are you going to put a note in there? And I said, no, 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 no. It has to be anonymous. I don't want to know where it's come from. So I do remember I would always be making or doing something I had I scrapbooks and, it and that it was, yeah, um, I don't, I, you know, well, she probably didn't know where it came from yeah, so. well, oh, it'd be worth lots of money, <laughs> um, so you didn't go to art school do you th think you you studied English didn't you I uh, did yeah uh, do you think that that was a benefit to becoming an artist in a way having the freedom to work that side you know the art school system and what did what did studying English bring to being an artist well, I'm not sure. Obviously, it worked out well for me that way because it, I don't think I probably would have started doing taxidermy if I'd gone to art college. I think maybe I would have been distracted by something else. But I don't think it specifically was a great training for being an artist other than that, I, you know, I do like words and I like reading and I... I and I do, I, I, uh, there was a time when I would have loved to have been a poet, but I just wasn't very good at it. No, that's better. <laughs> you don't earn any, earn any money as a poet, believe me. <laughs> you probably get a similar satisfaction from writing good poetry, though, to making art. But, and uh, and I, I just wasn't very good at it, so I found it very frustrating because I was never happy with what I'd produced. Um, but I was always trying to produce something, and I think, actually... It, in, once I did discover taxidermy and start making sculptures and, and making sort of more fully formed pieces, I realised that, in a way, for me, that, w that was sort of my way of writing poems, I suppose. Um, and with literature, I love books, I love reading, but I've got a really terrible memory for things. So I can read a book and I can literally, within a week, I, can f I wouldn't be able to tell you whether the protagonist was alive or dead at the end of the book. It just goes out of my mind straight away. And I have my mother and myself and my sisters, we've all got synesthesia where we sort of we see colors for days and um, numbers and letters and things so for me I get this very strong sense with, with books and films and things I can remember the color of the book and I can remember a certain sort of feeling around it but I wouldn't necessarily be able to tell you very much more than that even when I've read it and I think that that makes now that I'm making art I think it makes that makes a lot more sense to me because um I think much more visually well, I think it's quite an interesting way of remembering language as well. Um, after all, as I was saying in my poetry reading last night, I think language is yeah, it's just a different say, form yeah. of stuff and it's just a different sort of paint, you know. But um, that's another... Well, yeah, I would agree with that. That's, an, uh, that's another conversation. But who, who were your favourite writers when you... I mean, were the people that... You know, you, when you read somebody, you thought, ah, that perhaps influence the thinking that goes mm. into your art. Not directly, not directly, but... Um. Um, well, that's obviously changed throughout my life, but probably around the time I started making art, I was, I, I was reading, I think as a late teenager, early 20s, a bit of Marquez and um, Borges and, like, Magic Realists, which actually that's makes quite a lot of say. sense. Well, yeah. that... that Seems interesting in the mm. context of your work. Um, we're not talking about, um, you know, John Osborne and Kitchen Sink, mm. gritty reality. I mean, there is a, a, a sense of, uh, you know, the fantastical in your work. So, um, Well, yeah, I, what I liked about, and I have to say my tastes have changed. I don't think I, I would read those so much now. But at that time, what struck me about them was the, just that, that freedom that you have as an artist or a writer to just make anything happen, you know, you're not restricted by reality at all. And it, just oddly, it just hadn't really occurred to me, I don't think, until I discovered writers like that. And, and that's one of the exciting things about making anything is that yeah, you, can, you can create these whole sort of worlds for yourself, really, and um, live out fantasies that are never going to be a reality. Uh, but since then, I... Uh, my taste probably changed a bit. I, don't know, I love uh, Larkin. I like um, 
There's a particular, Gosh, I couldn't particular be more different to Marquez. I know. I mean, well, I, I was quite varied my taste, yeah. but more. So, I, I would say that suited me more now than then. Yes. And uh, oh, his, that, that poem, O oh Bard, is my yes. favourite. You know, that just that him dwelling on that terror of nothingness, and I think I can really uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I know that personally, I'm always trying to fill my time with things. I, I want to be experiencing things all the time, or I I, I start to feel very down and start to probably think well, dwell more on death it's like real consent you know beauty is nothing but uh, uh, the terror of nothingness that we're hardly able to bear or I, mm. I misquote it but mm. that's basically what he said and um, I th I think that's something that's very interesting I'm going to skip in a sense from our questions and talk about some of the things because we agreed that we'd have a conversation and yeah. some of the things that I s thought about this morning when you're talking about nothingness and I have to, might have to keep my glasses on and peer over the top um, I was thinking I, w I was digging into Camille Paglia um, I suddenly had a um, I'm going to take my glasses off because he's going to take a photograph <laughs> um, I was um, digging into Camille Paglia because suddenly I thought this morning at about six o'clock, um, oh, I think she's really relevant to your work um, because she writes so much about um, decadent art. And I think that's a phrase that is completely um, misunderstood, really, in a contemporary culture, you know, that, that decadent is seen as the opposite of good and moral, which of course it wasn't. Um, and what she talks about is, um, she says, civilized life requires a state of illusion. And basically her argument, and I agree with it, is she's talking about Rousseau versus Desired. And of course Rousseau being the great um, advocate of nature and all things natural. And um, what she argues is it's not society that is cruel and violent, but nature. And society is our frail barrier against nature. And I think that that fits in, in a way, with this sense of you're talking about the fear of nothingness. And uh, after all, the aesthetic movement and decadent art, you know, if you think of people like Wilde, um, beauty in a, in, in a way was the civilizing factor that constrained the great chthonic world out there, the nothingness, the terror, the, and on one level, it gave you something to do, as, it was, as, you, as, you, as you put it. But it was sort of a weapon against this chaos of nothingness. And I think that is the real um, meaning of decadent. And I think it is what applies to your art. Because decadent art is ritualistic, and it's pagan. Um, it's Baroque. And I wonder if any of that sort of rings true for you in the real sense of what was meant by decadent art, not something, you know, used by the Daily Mail? Um, well, I did, sorry, there's quite a lot in that to, to unpack. I'm just trying yes, to, well, wondering just where run quite with to the start. Bits that you well, I, I mean, I, I agree with what the, with the quotation that civilized life requires a state of illusion. I, I think that's very true, and I think um, that's probably why the idea in um, 1984 of thought crime was such a terrible uh, thought to all of us because, you know, we are all guilty of thought crime, but we can all manage to sort of pull ourselves together in society and behave in a certain way. And obviously when people have no reputation left in society, then they become a lot more dangerous to others. And uh, I think, so all of those things make sense to me. I think in terms of making work and making art, then that definitely... I don't know. For me, it really it just feels like a way of staying sane, I suppose, and a way of keeping myself in like in some sort of order, which I suppose is what you were what you were saying. Well, I think that that's what I'm sort of trying 
in a very roundabout way to reach towards that the I mean what Paglia suggests is you know that there's untamed nature and the process of making art um, well it's a way of kind of trying to decode things isn't it yes. and trying to make sense of the world around you and telling stories about it and all of those things I think are probably what drives an artist I think they're certainly what drives me and but it's it just are, given that you're dealing with dead animals um, who, in their natural environment, um, are not, you know, they're, they're, they're not intellectual beings, but they, they, they follow their own, you know, will, as it were. Hmm. The fact that they're dead means that you become a great controller, in a way. Well, in a way, but maybe in a way not, because they, they are dead, you know, it's a practical thing for me that, that I work with dead animals because I, I can't work with them when they're alive and I, I don't agree with caging animals or, or inhibiting any, their freedoms in any way so I just have to wait for them to vacate their bodies in order for me to, to start to use them as some kind of sculpting material and I really do see it as being quite black and white like that I don't um, there's no cruelty involved in my work if you know I'm not using anything that's been killed for for my purpose at all um, and I just see it as, yeah, I'm kind of sitting back and waiting for them to, to finish with it so that I can step but in. But you're, you're restructuring the world in a way, though, aren't you? You're, I mean, they had their, their yeah, but I sentient life, and now they have their life as art. And it's all what I mean by being the great control is that, um, you know, whatever it is, um, I know you don't have many pigeons, but, you know, you could have been a pigeon just leaping around up. Mm. Pigeons don't leap, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, uh, sort of uh, outside in Trafalgar Square. And then suddenly, you know, you, be you become art. You mm. become this immortal pigeon. So you are, in a sense, it is about a sort of transformation. It, it is, I suppose, but I don't see the... I really think also you could apply that to so many other materials. You know, people use charcoal to draw and that's made from dead wood or you know there's there's lots of materials in nature that are harnessed by artists and i i don't think once an animal has left the body that it becomes part of nature again it's just going to rot into the ground and it's going to become part of of the world again and so i suppose i'm i'm stepping in at that point and i'm changing what it was going to become but it doesn't. I don't really dwell that much on on the souls of the animals once they've left, because not unless I knew the animal personally, which is a very different matter. But I wouldn't. You work. mean I not just unless couldn't. you were formally introduced? <laughs> <laughs> no, and I'm never there at the point of death, so I have and I have no input in their death at all. So for me, unless I actually, you know, unless it was someone's pet that I had come across or encountered, I, I don't really have a very sentimental sort of attitude towards them once they've gone, because I. This no, I, I, I certainly couldn't. wasn't implying sentiment. Mm. I was implying something much harder than that, that were, um, in a way, exactly you become the sort of all-powerful orchestrator, the god, if you like, the artistic god, where you, you, they're transformed into mm. something other than what their natural state. And that's going back to, to Camille Paglia about controlling nature in a way because it becomes a question of artifice that that is exactly what she is saying decadent art is that it's about artifice and i mean your uh sculptures to call them that um are about artifice that's exactly the point of them isn't it yes i suppose so yeah i mean at that point i what i'm doing is i'm just I, I just feel I'm stepping in at that point and I'm stopping them going on to have the afterlife that they would have had. I mean, in a physical sense, not in a spiritual sense. So how, how did you get into but, um, um, taxidermy? Um, why? I, well, why is I find a bit harder to answer, but I, I got into it. I was trying loads of different things out in my early 20s. I, I went through, a bit, I did a bit of writing, did a bit of modelling with clay. Um, I tried so photography, lots of things, and it was only when taxidermy occurred to me, and I think the reason it occurred to me, it's a difficult question to answer, because I, I, all I know really is that I wanted to have some in my flat and I couldn't afford to buy it. But I think on a deeper level than that, 
it's actually because I don't like death and I don't like the fact that when something dies, it's taken away from you. And that with the dead animal, when it dies, it, I soon learned as a child when I'd try and pick them up and take them home with me that I couldn't do that because they would rot and they would disappear. And the thing about taxidermy is you can prevent that from happening. You can stop it at that point. Why did you, you want these them. animals? Why did you want to take them home when you were a child? Why did you want one in a flat? Because as a child, you're at your most natural, really, and I'm curious. And I think we're all very curious as human beings. You know, of course, we're naturally, we explore things. And I wanted to know more, and that's the best way you can possibly know more, is to look and to touch and feel. And I think, yeah, like for, for at school, particularly in science lessons, I, my overriding memory really was just one of boredom. And I think that's because I used to have to sit in front of teachers writing on a blackboard, sort of teaching me by rote. And it didn't really mean anything to me. It needed to, I, I'm very tactile and visceral. I want to touch something and smell it and get close to it. And that's the way that I form my memories. And I'm not going to remember something if you just repeat it over and over again to me. It'll, it becomes, it anesthetizes you to, to the subject matter. Whereas I think if you pick something up and you touch it and you've got a, you've got a, a, a memory of its smell, of its feel, of so many things that you can't access when they're alive, then that's really the best way of learning. And I, and I suppose as a child, that's what I was doing. And fortunately, I had the kind of parents who didn't snatch it off me and scream and tell me to never touch a dead animal again. So, um, as I have asked you before, you were never put off by the yuck factor. <laughs> no, I mean, there, of course, there's certain things that disgust me, just like maggots, any, the bad smells disgust me, but very rarely do you actually get them in taxidermy. You, I mean, you have to act pretty quickly on any animal. Um, you either freeze it, which means you can you know, work on it in years to come if you defreeze it, um, or you have to skin it straight away because if it starts to rot, then the feathers or the fur will fall out of the creature and you just, you're you just left with skin. Well, the other day you said it's more like being a butcher. <laughs> yeah, well, I do. Th it's a little like a, a butcher or a surgeon. It's kind of part butchery, surgery, part sculpture, really. Um, and it's not that different. You know, if you're someone who works with meat or even if you're just someone who lives in the countryside and has a better connection to where your food comes from I think you're less likely to be disgusted by these things and I, I'm just always a bit taken aback by how many people are disgusted by it or by the idea of it because all these people are meat eaters and they just go to the supermarket and buy their meat packaged under cellophane and they don't know where it came from and I think that you sort of as a meat eater you have a responsibility to know that and to be able to sort of follow that through um, so no I think Maggots are probably the worst thing, and I think that's just a primal programming to teach me not to eat the meat because it's off, um, and there's not a lot I can do about that, but I don't come across them on a regular basis. And really, my overriding feeling is intrigue and wonder because you learn so much about your own physiognomy when you're skinning these animals. It, I compare it to deep sea diving. It's like you can live on the earth and have no idea what's going on under there, under the, in the oceans if you don't go and have a look. And if you don't skin an animal, there's a huge part of it that you never see. You only see the outside. And it's, it's just a way of, I suppose, pulling, you know, looking at the, the, the puppet strings and understanding the workings of things. Well, it, it makes me think also um, of something that is actually not particularly prevalent in a postmodernist age but goes back much more to the Renaissance or the Enlightenment or the Victorians really with which is, you know we can go back to Leonardo dissecting things or oh, the, I mean ta taxidermy is something that really sort of if you can talk about taxidermy kicking off but in the 19th, 19th century um, with the Victorians and I have this theory that, uh, you know, that post-enlightenment thinking, modern thinking, then you, you, you think of Darwin bringing back his, his finches, that it was about, I mean, we are so um, blasé about knowledge now, because we more or less think we can know everything. But then the notion, as you only go you know, up, up the road to South Kensington and go to the Natural History Museum and you see all the taxidermid dodos and things that people brought back from wherever dodos come from, Galapagos or wherever it is. Um, because part of it was this desire, which was terribly strong in the Victorians, to, to label, to know, to categorise as a way of understanding the world and connects back, you know, to the Renaissance idea of the cabinet of curiosities where people stuck things 
that they didn't quite know how to name and um, didn't quite know what they were. But that unfolding, you see it, see it with Dharma in this desire to categorise. And taxidermy seems to belong to that tradition. Do you feel yourself linked to that in some way? Well, I'm linked to it in that if it hadn't happened, I probably, it, it sort of opened the way for what I'm doing now. And if it hadn't happened, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So I am, but I don't think that I'm adding anything to that because I don't, there's no need to anymore. Because as you say, we know so much now and, and not just that, but what, what the information that we do have is so easily accessible that there's no real urge to do that anymore. And I do think the Victorians were probably a bit under, misunderstood when people talk about them as being sort of quite a bit dark and gothic and macabre. And I don't, I think actually a lot, a lot of the time it's just that, you know, they were trying to find out. And in order to find out, you have to look at these things and to bring back dead bodies and, and uh, Well, I agree with you. I think that tends to be from a modernist or postmodernist mm. perspective that it seems dark to us, you know, in the way that uh, Freud talked about dark continents or, you know, mm. Joseph Conrad talked about the heart of darkness. But I don't think it was meant like that. I think No, we don't have to be like that now. No. You know, we live in such a, in because a, a world that we can sort of, everything can be very sanitised, you know. And yes, but also that darkness was not necessarily a sort of a bad darkness, but it was like if you looked at the map of Africa, most of it was empty. It was about a lack of knowledge and a desire for knowledge. So that I think that was what it was really about. Mm. The name, you know, not black versus white, good versus bad, sort of dark, but dark of an absence, an absence of knowledge, which we have, as you say, large, largely, or we like to feel we have, we have filled. So, it, well, I, I think taxidermy had almost recently, it, it was, I suppose, under threat of becoming completely irrelevant because, or just being, you know, a bit of fun for people to put in their houses because we don't need taxidermy in order to le learn about animals because we've got David Attenborough and we've got beautiful photographs and videos and diagrams and everything we could possibly want. And actually, taxidermy now is probably one of the least good ways of learning about animals. So it had got to a point where it was a bit redundant, I think. And, you know, there was obviously the craft tradition of making these cabinets where you mimic the natural environment of animals, which it was, is still ongoing, but it, it's definitely a lot less popular than it used to be. So I'd, I think, probably unwittingly, really, I just came to taxidermy at a point where a lot of people in the practice were telling me it was dying out, and I couldn't see how I could add anything to their tradition of mimicking the environment of the animal. They were doing that very well. They a lot of them still are. So I wanted to somehow bring it up to date a little bit or to try and do something new with it, something that I hadn't seen done before. And I suppose, you know, there's a way to get my work noticed maybe, but that, that wasn't my conscious thought. I just didn't want to do something that I could see that had done better down the road, I guess. Okay, to ask a really candid question then. Do you see... Do you see the work as art, or do you just see it as interesting decoration? And if you do see it as art, what for you defines art? What for you, I mean, you know, oh, Joseph Boyce said anyone can be an artist, but I actually don't think mm. that's what he really meant. I think he was talking about a political situation, but it's rather misquoted, I think. But even so, I mean, there's obviously something rather uncanny and about the work and you know I one can see it does see it uh, in a sort of rather trendy restaurant or something as being but for you as an artist what 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 makes it what makes it art well I try to make art when I started out I don't think I was trying to make art now I would say that I was uh, what I was doing was I didn't really know I was just following some instinct that I had and uh, people started to refer to it as art. Galleries wanted to exhibit it. People, you know, the odd person would write about it or buy it. And, you know, to start with, definitely, I just sort of went along with what was happening to me without really thinking or questioning it too much. But then there came a point where I realized that I had to really sort of, if I was going to continue in this way, I had to think more responsibly about what I was doing and really sort of not just make something and put it out there, but actually 
think about it, plan it, interrogate the idea, make sure that it stood up, and I, I was happy with it before I put it out. And so where do those ideas come from? I mean, what is the, the hinterland behind the, which is the hard thing well, to so Can I just answer your first question mm -hmm. a bit more before I say that? Sure. Just to, when you were asking me about what... Uh, what makes an artist, I suppose. To begin with, I don't think I was, and I think that I um, rather naively sort of thought that I could just make things and put them out there, and th that if people called them art, then that's what they were. And But actually, I've come to realise that art is a, a form of language, really, and that people who practice within it sort of communicate with each other, and it's not... You wouldn't... Well, you could turn up to a foreign country, and you could just insist on speaking English the whole time and you would be understood by a few and you'd probably get by, but you'd never become a native and you'd never really get to know that country properly. And I think that, to use that analogy, that's the art is, is similar to that, that you do have to start to understand what, where you fit in and what's gone before and, and to try to respect the, your, your former the, the practitioners before you, I guess. Um, but as for whether or not I call myself an artist, I don't know. I mean, it's such a loaded term for some reason. And I just have to categorise my work in one way or another, and I don't, I don't really see myself as being a craftsperson because I don't operate within that tradition. It doesn't really fit there, and it's just a way of trying to categorise what I do. And I kind of think that it's for other people to decide whether or not I'm an artist rather than myself, in a way. You know, and history will probably tell you whether or not anyone thought I was an artist. I don't know. I mean, I, I would like more people to think that. Maybe some do, others don't. But I really, I don't want to trouble myself too much with thinking about that. I want to think more about what I'm producing and making sure that I'm happy with it. To go back to the other question, which is, what is the intellectual, emotional hinterland to the work? In other words, what I actually, as a critic, would say, in a way, make something art as opposed to just an object. Um, what, what, what are your, if you like, it's a big question and answer it however it feels appropriate. To, what are the philosophical concerns that inform the work? Or is it just simply I'm going to sit down and, you know, work on this stunt or whatever it is mm. that happens to have been posted th to you? No. Or, or, or do you have a an idea, an intellectual framework in which, of, c of course, it's neither entirely one or the other, because, uh, and neither is it if you're writing a poem or a novel. Um, you know, you, that, at that moment, you were caught up in the process of it. But behind it is a hinterland of, of thought. Well, that just really does vary quite a bit from mm. works and shows and things. But uh, there's, I've made works that have... I, I do use birds quite a lot in my work, and I think that I find the idea of flight an interesting one, and and just that the idea that uh, that we as humans have, for some reason, you know, we're earthbound creatures, and yet we always sort of have this need to fly. Like over the centuries, we've tried so many different crazy ways, like strapping balloons to our chairs, or you know, making wings and jumping off things and dying. Um, there's so many different ways that we have tried to, and obviously we've kind of mastered it to some degree now, but I, I kind of, I spent quite a long time thinking about that and about what that means and, and how, in a way, it's sort of like art, you know, that, that wish to kind of elevate yourself and to transcend life in a way. Um, and some of my works have definitely tried to address that, where I, I did a show called Psychopomps, which was making st sculptures that was supposed to kind of um, represent winged escorts from life to death, I suppose. Um, there's been other works they that They seem very ritualistic, some of those sculptures. Um. Well, I wanted them to be... My, the idea was to make them look almost like something that could exist, but just doesn't, you know, something that you can... Uh, that I did these winged... kind of They were balloon shapes, and they were made out of um, stratas of wings, and each level unfurled slightly more than the one below. So you could sort of imagine it almost pulsating and you think if you did have a, a, a form that was made in that shape with those wings, that's perhaps how it would fly. I wanted to try and create something that was almost believable. Um, an I've improvement <laughs> on Icarus. <laughs> well, I don't know about an improvement, but yeah, a line on Icarus. Yes, well, he didn't do too well. <laughs> so, um. Um, 
and other works I've done. I mean, a lot of my work, I think, addresses the idea of life, actually, and life after death. I think a lot of people think, uh, when they first see my work, and maybe still think that it's all about death. And actually, I'm quite a positive, quite an optimistic person. And, and I, I think the thing that amazes me is that things do die all the time. But when they die, thousands of new things are born. And that just that constant cycle that we're part of. And I think that doing taxidermy is such a humbling experience because is a form of momentum mori. You're, you're, being you're constantly being reminded that you're going to die. And well, that's one of the other things that when we were talking the other day, I mean, that came up mm. for me, that in a way that these are sort of almost like postmodernist version of vanitas paintings, and they actually fit very much within that tradition of the vanitas painting and momentum but mori. Hopefully, with, the, with the, always kind of with a positive spin, really, because for me... It's always about, yes, you're going to die, but life always goes on. And, and I've done the, uh, the piece I made with a coffin that's splitting open like an egg with thousands of little chicks coming out of it. That, that was kind of inspired by these pictures that I took of um, uh, maggots, infested corpses. Um, and the fact that these corpses become nests for all this new life. And, you know, so off, so much of things, it just depends on your perspective on how you look at them. And um, an awful lot of my work... Uh, these other ones that I've done, uh, drawings of nests made out of the cremated remains of the birds um, that are sitting on top of the frames. They're, they're always ultimately quite optimistic, quite positive things, really, I think. I don't want to just... I, I, hate, I don't like people who revel in death. I'm not really particularly keen on sort of the, the whole gothic thing of, like, dressing up as corpses and stuff. I don't, I don't think it's... You know, it's a horrible, pathetic thing, illness and death, and it's not something that I... Um, take lightly so I always I'm slightly I suppose a little bit upset when people just think that I'm talking about death or trying to be macabre for any for just for its own sake I suppose and that's that's certainly never been my intention but I mean it takes us back to the quotes by Nietzsche and Camille Paglia um, about art being a way of taming nature, in a way, and that although um, they are, they're inevitably about death, you couldn't be using dead animals, but that what you uh, are doing is investigating you know, that endless cycle between... Yeah, they're as much life. about life as they are yeah. about death. They really but, are. But that you can't have one without the other. And exactly, I mean, it's yeah. a bit like, you know... The king is dead. Long live the king, um, and that there is this natural cycle. There is this natural rhythm between um, life and death. D does that feel? Does that feel true for you? Definitely, absolutely, yeah. That's that. That is, yeah. That is uh, behind an awful lot of my work. Um, uh, yeah, I could pr probably pretty much say that applies to my work across the board. How much, um, just before we open this up to questions with other people, um, how much are you influenced or have you been influenced by other contemporary artists? I mean, you're, you're younger than the YBAs. So um, when you first saw Damien's work, for example, did that... Um, give you a sense of permission that you could use animals, that art could be something other than, um, you know, drawing or sculpture or whatever? Mm. Um, um, it, it quite probably did, subliminally, yeah. I don't remember ever having thought, uh, having really thought about his work when I started doing taxidermy, actually. But I think I'd first seen the first piece sort of in the flesh, as it were, excuse the pun, um, was in the Sensation show. I think I would have been about 16 or something. I came up to London to see that, and I think that's where he exhibited, a, a, I think this is a thousand years, that was in the Sensation, yes, wasn't it? Yeah. With the, um, the cow's the yes, right, so. with the cow's head and the flies and yes. the insecticuter. And, and that probably now remains my favorite of his works. Well, I think it's and the best piece he ever made. Yeah. And uh, I remember being struck by that in that show. And I, although I didn't really consciously think about it again, I obviously the, the themes that he's addressing in that very much have been mirrored in, in a lot of my work. Although I don't think visually the work, other than the fact that we use dead animals, I don't think um, th my work resembles his particularly strongly. Um, 
In terms of being influenced by artists, I, I'm sure I am influenced by them all the time, particularly as I have lots of friends who are artists, so th I just can't fail to be influenced by the people that I'm, I'm hanging out with. But f oddly, the work that I, uh, the artists that I admire often make work completely different to my own. I find it easier, really, to admire work, technical ability that I don't have at all, perhaps. Such as? I love Paul Noble's drawings, for instance. I mean, I, I can draw ish, but I'm not, you know, not like that. And anyone who can do something or, or think on a totally different scale to me, that's what I, I really, really, I like Sarah Lucas's work and, you know, my work doesn't resemble hers at all. And I love the, the kind of connection to materials, I suppose, and the well, humor. Well, I suppose in the it. only thing about that connects you with Sarah Lucas in a way is the, the use of non-art materials, the mm. permission that you can make art out of a pair of old tights yeah. or a dead bird, you know, I mean, the, you, you know, or... Well, and the physical, I like the physical making, you can really see her hand in oh. it, I, and I do like do you enjoy that? How much has that become part of your life? And how, or, how, or um, does it detract? Well, as a couple, we don't do that. Um, there was one thing once that I got sort of um, slightly tricked into doing because they said they were going to show a tiny little picture of me in the corner and then they ended up blowing it big and making it out to be a big couples thing because we never do any um, press as a couple at all. Um, but I suppose in the beginning, I think right at the start when you get asked to do things like that, you're just so flattered that anyone's interested in you or your work and you've been making stuff and but most of the world's never seen it. So you think, well, that'll, that's going to get you more of an audience. Um, but then it soon becomes, I think if you're not careful, it can start to take over a little because as soon as there's one or two things like that, then suddenly there's 10 or 15. And, and it not only does it... Um, eat into your time, which I really resent, actually. That's the worst thing about it. And the reason why I turn most things like that down now is because I can't, um, I just don't have the time for it. They, you know, people turn up in your studio and there's like nine, 10 people, those are cameras and stuff, and they don't go till the end of the day. Um, but what I've noticed, I suppose, is it does actually affect, I, I, don't, I don't think it changes me at all, and I don't think it changes my work, but I think that it changes the way people look at me um, and the way that people perceive my work, probably. And that um, is something that I, I'm not happy about, I suppose, and something that I would like to change. So that that's about taking something back, doesn't to you say, well, I am this as opposed to this. Well, you start doing it because you want people to look at your art, well, and then you realise they're looking at you, and then it's actually had the reverse effect because as an artist, I mean, I'm I'm not a social person um, naturally at all. I don't I go out actually very little, probably once a month at the moment, if if that. And uh, I spend an awful lot of time on my... It's very solitary being an artist and you sort of... You get a little bit of attention and you sort of think, oh, well, maybe this is going to be a good thing. And and then suddenly you find everyone's looking at you and that's the last thing you wanted. You wanted them to look at the work and because you, you hide behind the work a lot of the time as an artist. You're not... You don't want to be in the limelight. You want people to look at your work and then you want to go and hide somewhere and watch them watch it. Uh, and so I think that is the flip side to it. And perhaps to start with, I've, you know, there have definitely been some things I would have taken back. You know, you, at the beginning you don't understand how much or how little control you've got of your own image when people start taking pictures of you and writing articles and you know they interview you but then they end up totally paraphrasing you in their own words and it doesn't sound like you and it it just becomes kind of an irritation more than more than a help but it's just a fine balance i suppose you do there's a lot of artists there's a lot of people out there you you want to get your work seen so that you have to you know do it Take okay, it all well with a pinch of salt. Shall we um, take some questions if um, anybody... You can ask either of us because we'll hop between... Well, you probably want to ask Polly, but... If you can comment. <laughs> You need, you need the thingy. Hi, a uh, question Hi. for Polly. Um, one of my favourite little stories uh, that I read about you when you were little, uh, which involves your mum, was when she opened a handbag and she uh, was going to get some headache tablets out. When yeah. she opened the pillbox, a hamster, dead hamster fell out. <laughs> and um, I quite like that because it's really natural. And um, I just wondered whether you ever sort of look back and think that was a natural way of being and you still are now but it's become art so I just wonder what your thoughts were on about that really and whether you hark back and 
you, you know, how it affects you now when you You mean back. just thinking about the way that I was raised and about the animals and, and... Yeah, all those little moments. You were, in a way, mm. making a little art piece, but you were sort of naive to it then because of your age, as we all did. Well, yeah, I things. do think a lot of artwork is sort of... Well, art, artists, generally, they are just like children that haven't grown up, really, a lot of the time. Because when I was yeah. growing up, I was always being told... Yeah, you're going to have to stop do playing and doing that now because you're going to have to get serious and get a proper job. And, and you know, obviously a lot of people have to rein that in and get a proper job because they have to make an income. And I was very fortunate in finding something that I could make an income from. But I think it is... Artists do seem to have that in common that they kind of resist that pull to just stop doing those things. And I certainly haven't changed very much from those days, I don't think. And... I am thankful, even though it was a strange upbringing and it wasn't always perfect. You know, there was. I'm. I'm very thankful for the fact that my parents sort of gave me the freedom to do all of those. I used to mm. breed hamsters in the bath at home, and I just. I mean, we had. It was completely chaotic. But I think if if it hadn't been for all of that, I'm sure somehow that did inform what I'm doing now. Yeah, and do you um, sometimes think, oh, you know, the little things that you probably did? Do you ever like? I noticed you did some uh, something in matchboxes. Mm. And I thought that was lovely because it was so nostalgic and it's the scale of it's quite sort of cute as well. Uh, when you were doing that, did you ever hark back and did you actually think about your childhood when you were doing the matchbox and the things in yeah. it? You know what I Definitely mean? Definitely, I did, yeah. That was very much sort of about those little coffins and things that you make as um, as a child. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming I'm not the only one who did that. I think lots of people, you know... <laughs> the you, matchbox you, thing, you yeah. Put, yeah, and bury yeah. them in the garden and make the little crosses yeah. and that kind of thing. So, yes, I definitely was thinking about that. Yeah, and I, I really enjoy that as um, something when I was looking through the book I had, yeah. Sorry, am I going on? <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, do you ruminate on human death at all? And does your work in any way you feel have a relation to how you feel about human death? Um, I try not to ruminate on human death too much. Unfortunately, I suppose I've had to quite a few times. I've had quite a few friends and family die over the years, so I've had to at, at times. I don't think I handle it any better than anyone else. Um, I I do get asked quite a lot, you know, whether I, do, I, do you think about death and do you thinking about that when you're skinning the animals? And fortunately, I don't, or I'd be a gibbering wreck, I think, by now. Um, so I do have to really divorce myself from, from that fact. Otherwise, you know, I would find what I do too upsetting. Um... No, I mean, you know, I'm resigned to the fact that I'm going to die and I can't do anything about it, unfortunately. <laughs> I try to avoid thinking about it as much as I can. And just, you know, my main thing is just to try and fill my life as much as I possibly can. I can't, I'm not good at being idle. I don't ever really have half an hour. I just lie around doing nothing. I don't really enjoy that. Thank you. Um, well, I hope it comes into my work every now and then. I don't consciously do it, but I... I, I think it's yeah. I, well, she just asked me about humour in my work. Um, and I know that I love humour in other people's work. I'm, I'm always really drawn to irreverence in literature and in art. And I do think it's kind of important just never to take anything too, too seriously. Um, and I do, I think... Uh, Oddly, you know, when, when someone dies, often that's when people are at their most humorous. People become very witty and have really sort of sharp black humor during that time. And I think that there's a reason for that. And I guess it's just something we that pulls us back from the brink all the time. And I guess I have to... My work probably needs an element of that to just stop it from being kind of miserable, I suppose. I need to... Uh, for me, it's important to have that sort of black humor to it so that it's just not all about death. Um, hi. Uh, hi. I have a couple of questions. Oh, I don't know where the mic is. Okay, sorry. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, but I'll try and do them quickly. Um, I noticed that in your workshop when you were skinning the stag um, that you had a few dogs. Mm -hmm. um, do they interfere at all? Because we've got dogs and I was just sort of interested if they try and eat the meat or... Well, uh, the only time that's ever happened was then with the stag, actually. Yeah, Trotsky, my, the bull terrier who had his head resting on it, he got very territorial about the uh, stag. I think he thought he'd killed it himself. 
And uh, he just sat incredibly close to it the whole time, growling at my other dog if he came near. <laughs> um, and at one point, he did try and tear some strips off it, so I sort of shooed him away. But um, no, actually, they're really not interested very much at all. They'll, I get things posted to me quite regularly, and they'll always, like, whenever I see them shoot to the post and sniff around, I know that I've received something. Um, but once something has been stuffed or mounted, that's when they're not really interested because it starts to smell different, I suppose. Like one of my, my little Terry is obsessed with, goes completely ballistic if he sees a cat. And I've just done a cat recently and he's just like, doesn't even look twice at it. So it's, it's quite interesting. It's all about the smell for them. Um, also, yeah, I was wondering what you do with the, like the, in the innards and like the bodies of the meat. Mm. Do you, because I noticed that you, did you salt? The corpse? Or uh, not the corpse, the skin you have to salt. Yeah. Oh, the, you um, salt the skin. Mm -hmm. and then um, well, I just throw them away generally. Um, I did always have this fantasy that I'd just live uh, by eating the meat that, from the animals that I've skinned. But in reality, by the time you've finished doing that, and it, you're just so disgusted by that part, you want to get rid of it because it's covered in grease and hair and stuff. Um, uh, for the, something like the stag, I had to dismember it into parts and get a pet crematorium to come and collect it because you need to dispose of it. Um, properly or you'll get into trouble um, you do need it as long as it takes you to build the body though because you need to take uh, measurements from it hi polly this is um, a question for you i i work in sculpture and i use pheasants which my family eat um and i've had the privilege of uh picking up a baby unhatched bird outside the door of this building on my way in. Just so now? I've got it here now. <laughs> <laughs> Are you um, about to present it to me? <laughs> I will show it to you. It's still in the egg and it's half hatched. Oh, and well. It's dead and it was at the bottom of the tree just outside the door. So right. So on a practical God. level, um, what would you do with that? I know. I, I had to put it in my lunch nothing to do bag with me. and take my lunch <laughs> out. <laughs> Sorry, so what, what, we, what was what the... What would you do with that? So I'm... I've I know what to do with... I'd probably do what you do. I'd probably <laughs> carry it around for a while in my bag and then <laughs> put it in the freezer. I, I wouldn't be able to do anything like it, with a... I, that's something that size you can't taxidermy. It needs to... You, you do depend on it having um, a covering of fur or feathers um, and a baby one wouldn't, but I would perhaps try to cast it or something. I, or okay. I don't know. I'm not sure, really. I'd have to have a I'll look. I'll show it to you at the end. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I've never worked with anything that, that's young before. Hi, Polly. Hi. Um, I noticed when you done the project with Mother of Pearl that you were coming outside of the like using your artistic flair in other areas. Do you ever worry that you're going to become bored of taxidermy, and would you ever look at doing something else outside of your medium? Uh, yes, I already have, actually, a little. Um, I've certainly become bored of seeing taxidermy everywhere, and... Um, including in my studio. So um, I am... Because I didn't go to art school, I didn't have... Um, like very sort of thorough teaching in anything. So everything that I do, I, I'm kind of self-taught. Um, and I've learnt to etch and I do draw now and then. You know, I'm not particularly great at it, but, you know, I'm, I'm getting better the more I do it. And I've learnt to cast uh, things. So I do use quite a lot of casting these days and I'm experimenting with that. So I'm hoping, I think the more that I learn, certainly the wider... I can think really, you know, the broader I can think. And I, I do, I don't think I'll ever give up taxidermy altogether because I do actually really enjoy it, but um, I don't do it every day at all. So I'll have sort of periods where I'll do it for a few weeks and then I'll do other stuff. And my works generally involve, these days, they involve lots of other materials too. So it, it has become part of a much broader practice, but people are generally more interested in the taxidermy. Holly, Hi. Um, what's the strangest way or animal you've ever been presented with an animal? Is it the strangest way I've been presented? Well, uh, do people just give you them? How, um, how, where do they come from? Yeah, they do, yeah. Um, my little, my nephews once turned up to an exhibition that I had with my sister, and um, but they they just came running up to me going, we've got something for you, we've got something for you, and they just like dragged this baby deer out of the car and dumped it at my feet in front of the <laughs> exhibition. That was quite good. Um, but I get sent things a lot. Yeah, I have strangers calling up the studio a lot who um, maybe have seen something on, in the press or they Google taxidermy and find me that way. And they do send me things. I had a gannet sent from a woman in Liverpool recently who just found it on the beach. Um, all kinds of things, really. But I do. Uh, that's what I depend on, really, to keep going. So uh, fortunately, there's a lot of people who do that. I think a lot of people like the idea that it's going to you know, become something else. It's having some sort of an afterlife. Hi, 
Hi. Hi. Um, I suppose this follows on from the last question. Um, have you worked with an animal that you'd never want to touch again? And um, is there a particular am animal that you'd love to work with? Uh, yeah, rats weren't much fun. They, they did just smell horrible naturally and they've got a lot of bacteria on their skin so their fur often slips off. Um, I think you can also get some disease from their urine that sends you mad, apparently. And once I heard about that, I thought I'd be a bit careful. Um, uh, hedgehogs are difficult, not so much because of the spines, but because of all the, these... On the inside of the spines, they've got this whole sort of lattice work of uh, muscles between the, the spines that's very difficult to cut away. Um, but in terms of like a fantasy animal, I don't really have that because it depends a lot on what I'm working with. Uh, if I if I come up with an idea that involves a certain animal that I don't have, then that becomes something that I'm trying to, to get hold of. It's not really... For me, it's not just about working with a really beautiful or an exotic animal. That's much more the interest um, of, a, of a traditional taxidermist, I think, because they're looking for rare birds or, or something. But um, no, it's very much tied in with whatever it is that I'm making at that time. Hi, Polly. Um, how much do you say the shock factor would impact on your work? Do you ever think about what people will see? Is it going to be shocking for them? Do you, um, does that ever come into your mind? Just now, when I sat down here and I looked up and I saw the skin stag, I suddenly worried that people might be a bit disgusted or horrified by that. Because, um, I, like I said, I do become a bit sort of inured to a lot of these things. I've seen, I see them over and over again, and I'm doing it all the time. That I, I do forget that, actually, the work-in-progress images are at least can be quite shocking. Um, but as for my work, I, I don't do that. I certainly never just set out to shock people. And I, I'm always quite surprised that people are shocked by it because I do think that, particularly in the art world, people do go to exhibitions to in order to sort of uh, broaden their horizons, I suppose. They're, if they're interested in art, they're generally interested in being challenged in some way, I think. So I wouldn't expect that sort of reaction in a gallery. I have done a show before... Um, uh, there's a show at Sudley Castle in the Cotswolds that I was in, and there was lots of contemporary art scattered around the, the grounds, and I know that they had a couple of complaints there, but I think that was because people thought they were coming to see the grounds of a castle. They didn't think they were going to come across things like that. So it's about context, really. If it's in, if it's somewhere where people expect to see it, then, then that's okay. But if they just come across it at random, then maybe they're more likely to be shocked. Which would you say is your most controversial piece yourself? Um... I don't know. I think the one, I, I think maybe the, hmm, I'm not sure, maybe that one with the coffin and the little chicks, perhaps, just because it's a coffin and people, I think people often just think that's a really macabre, almost sort of horror mm. style piece and it, it really, I, that's not what I'd wanted at all. I had really wanted that to be quite a um, positive piece because it's all about you know, rebirth, really. But uh, yeah. maybe maybe that one, I'm not sure. I don't tend to hang around and wait for the reactions. I get the hell out of there as soon as I've installed it. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? So I think it's probably yeah, it's two o'clock now. So um, thanks everyone for coming.